Hello. Today we're going to talk about the chemical synapse. So this might sound familiar to you because we've actually already studied like a specialized chemical synapse known as the neuromuscular junction. So remember that was where the nerve meets a muscle fiber and the axon terminal, the end of the nerve, would release acetylcholine, a neurotransmitter, and then it would bind to the receptors on muscle to signal contraction. So today we're just going to talk about this basically more generically. We're going to talk about the chemical synapse between one neuron and another neuron. So far we've been talking about just what happens like inside a neuron, like how the membrane potential is maintained and how an action potential travels. But once the nerve impulse gets all the way to the end, it can't transvol directly to the next neuron because like see the axon and the dendrites, there's not touching. There's a little gap in between them called the synapse, and the synapse is full of fluid. When that current or that nerve impulse gets in the fluid, it basically dissolves and it can't be transmitted across. So instead of using an electrical signal, we use a chemical signal in the form of neurotransmitters. So here is the electrical signal, the action potential coming all the way down, and then when it gets to the end, it does a chemical signal, neurotransmitters, and then we can do the electrical signal, the action potential all the way down, and then when it gets here again, it would release more neurotransmitters as the chemical signal. And the presynaptic neuron is the one that's sending the signal. The postsynaptic neuron is receiving the signal. So the presynaptic neuron secretes neurotransmitters, and then the neurotransmitter binds to the postsynaptic neuron and causes an effect. Um, that's pretty much it. If you're interested, keep listening. I'm now going to say it in a little bit more detail. So just like the neuromuscular junction, everything starts when the action potential arrives at the axon terminal. So that's like the brain is going to send a signal. It's going to travel through our nerves. There's a little pink arrow's the action potential. When the action potential reaches the axon terminal, it causes voltage-gated cal voltage calcium channels to open, and this allows calcium to go down its concentration gradient and enter the neuron. So calcium is just floating in this extracellular fluid, and when these gates open, it rushes in. Calcium is positive. So when a bunch of positive calcium ions enter, it causes depolarization, or it makes this whole inside positive. But that, this time, is the trigger for the vesicles to be able to release their neurotransmitters. So the action potential arrives. The action potential causes calcium to enter. The entrance of calcium causes the vesicle to secrete its neurotransmitter. And then what's going to happen? The neurotransmitter is going to move across the synapse. So right here is the synaptic cleft. That's that fluid-filled cavity that I was describing earlier. It's going to diffuse across and bind to the receptor. And depending on which neurotransmitter it is and which receptor it's binding to, it can have a variety of different effects. And you're probably familiar with neurotransmitters. Like we already talked about acetylcholine, the one that causes muscle contraction. But there's also like dopamine, serotonin, histamine, GABA, lots of different chemicals causing different effects. Once the neurotransmitter binds, it, cause, it causes a graded potential. It's sort of like a mini action potential. A graded potential is like a local change in membrane potential. When I say local, I mean like short distance, like it changes the electrical charge like of right here on this part of the membrane. And why do we care about that? Because this local change can trigger an action potential, which is like a widespread change. So the neurotransmitter binds, it causes a graded potential, which will eventually cause the action potential, and the action potential will travel all the way down the neuron. We're not done yet, though, because if this neurotransmitter stays bound right there, it's going to keep producing graded potentials. So we need to get rid of it somehow. There are three different ways that we can get rid of the neurotransmitter, and this little box is like a zoom out here showing what can happen. You can have reuptake, where the neurotransmitter is taken back into the presynaptic neuron that released it, 
or um, sometimes um, astrocytes will reuptake neurotransmitters. Remember those star-shaped star -shaped glial cells that kind of like clean up this area? So we can have reuptake. We can have an enzyme break it down, like acetylcholine esterase breaks down acetylcholine. Or sometimes it just diffuses away from a synapse and it will get um, reuptaken into a cell in a different part of the body. And that's that. Here's a picture of it all together. Um, I will mention that a lot of drugs work by interfering with this step six right here. Like you might be familiar with Prozac. It's a serotonin reuptake inhibitor. So basically, if you take the antidepressant Prozac, it's going to bind right here to this protein and it's going to prevent serotonin from being taken back in. Therefore, serotonin is going to stay here and it's going to keep causing graded potentials and serotonin causes kind of like a happy feeling, but helps make you feel better. Um, also like alcohol, caffeine, all sorts of street drugs like um, heroin or you know, all that stuff is going to interact by like stopping neurotransmitters from being released or keeping them from being taken back. Okay, so the presynaptic neuron releases a neurotransmitter and then that neurotransmitter binds to the postsynaptic neuron. And then we said it causes a graded potential. Um, it can cause two different types of graded potentials, like an excitatory or an inhibitory graded potential. So here's a graph for an excitatory one, and let's take a look at what's happening. Our resting membrane potential is negative 70, so an excitatory raises the membrane potential. That means it makes it more positive. This is a depolarization. Depolarization, less polar, less negative. This is going to make it easier to send a signal. If the membrane potential doesn't reach negative 55, there will not be an action potential. That's why this is a graded potential, because it's less than negative 55. But this depolarization still makes it much easier to send a signal. Over here with our inhibitory one, we can see that this hyperpolarizes the membrane because it makes it even more negative, and this is going to make it less likely to send an action potential. So inhibitory. So excitatory causes depolarization, makes it easier to signal. Inhibitory causes hyperpolarization, makes it harder to send a signal. And here's all of that in a video form. And please send me all your questions.